Hey guys, James Sane here. So in today's video, we're going to talk about how to interpret an atrial waveform. So not arterial, but atrial waveform. So if you have a wedge, uh, a right atrial waveform or a left atrial waveform. So let's get to it. All right, so first here, it's helpful to understand this is the Wigger's diagram. It's a relationship of the events of the um, the aortic pressure, the LV, the the wedge of the left atrial, and the EKG, as the mechanical and the electrical activities relate to each other. So we will specifically be looking at here on the screen this dotted line of this A wave, this C wave, and this V wave. Now, it is important to note that. The electrical activity, like for example, so atrial systole is represented by the P wave on the EKG. The electrical activity is recorded much faster than a pressure is generated inside the body, transmitted to a catheter that is somewhere positioned in the body, which is then transmitted to a transducer and turned into an electrical signal. signal. So we can record the electrical activity of the heart as compared to some pressure generated by the aorta, some pressure generated by the right atrium or left atrium or the uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay, so here is an example on the screen of a right atrial waveform. And there's similar characteristics to a right atrial waveform, a left atrial waveform, or a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So um, the reason we do pulmonary capillary wedge pressure it was for a number of reasons, but the pulmonary wedge, uh, it estimates what the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is. Because if you have a catheter as far out into the pulmonary artery as you can, you have a balloon blown up, there is only a sensing tip on the end of the balloon, and it looks forward on the end of the catheter, and it looks forward into the pulmonary bed, which then transmits pressures out to the pulmonary vein, transmits pressures because between to the left atrium because between the pulmonary veins and the left atrium, there's no valve. And then that estimates the left atrial pressure. And then when the mitral valve is open, you're looking down into the left ventricle at the end of diastole. So that's why a wedge pressure represents or estimates the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. As long as there's nothing between the tip of the catheter and the left ventricle. You could have a clot in your pulmonary artery. You could have a clot in your left atrium. That would make the wedge estimating the LVEDP not accurate. There are, there are more things. So here is a right atrial waveform. <clears throat> so the components of what we're looking at is an A wave, and then you have a descent and then a C wave, the descent continues, and then another wave, which is called the V wave, and the descent of that. So the A wave represents atrial contraction. The first part of this descent before the C wave is called X1, is atrial emptying, and then when the pressure in the atria gets below the pressure in the ventricle, the atrioventricular valves close, the tricuspid and the mitral valve, and that causes a C wave. And then the pressure continues to drop. This is X to descent. Now, as the atria start filling, as blood returns from the inferior and superior vena cavas and blood returns from the pulmonary veins on the left side of the heart, and the IVC, SVC on the right side of the heart, obviously, the pressure starts building, and then you get this V wave. Then, when the atrioventricular valves open, this is the peak of the V wave. And as they empty out, the pressure drops. This is Y descent. So some books will refer to Y descent as the opening of the atrioventricular valve. Some books will refer to the peak of the V wave as where the atrioventricular valves uh, open up. So let's look into this a little bit further as how it relates to how you determine what's the A wave and what's the V wave when you're looking at waveforms. Okay, so the commonality between a right atrial, a left atrial, and a wedge pressure is that they all have an A wave. Oftentimes you don't see the 
C wave, and they all have a V wave. Well, okay. They all have an A wave if you have atrial contraction. If you're an atrial fib, atrial flutter, you don't have an A wave. Um, now, the way that you read this, you need to see an EKG in the atrial pressure waveform, or you need to see an LV pressure in the atrial waveform to get an idea because the A wave looks very much like a C wave. You just can't magically look at the pressure all by itself. You could make a pretty good guess, but if the heart rate's fast, you could be wrong. So the A wave, when you're in the right atrium, the A wave follows the P wave by about 80 milliseconds. So the A wave, which represents atrial contraction, will always follow the P wave. And that makes sense because the P wave on the EKG is atrial contraction and we can record the electrical activity quicker so we can record the p wave closer to the event of atrial contraction then we can measure the a wave that reflects atrial contraction as well so if you find the p wave and then come straight down the next hump of the waveform is the a wave so here's a couple examples uh here's find the p wave Come straight down. The next hump over is the A wave. And the V wave follows the T wave on the EKG. So the V is in that TP uh, area. So if you find the T wave on the EKG, come down and the next uh, hump on the waveform is the V wave. Or on this example, the EKG comes straight down, and the next hump up is the V wave. So this is the V, this is the A. And then you can look here on the same example. And you can know on the right atrial waveform, it's going to be about 80 milliseconds. Let's take a look at a wedge. Oh, first, before we jump into the wedge, here I've... I've um, put it all on one page that the A wave, so the A wave represents atrial contraction. No, all right, so the components of atrial systole and diastole are not exactly the same as ventricular systole and diastole. So in the ventricles, the ventricles contract in response to an electrical stimulus. The pressure starts building up, the valves open, and the ventricles empty out their contents. And then when the valves close, Hopefully they close the way they're supposed to because of the pressure gradient. Now the atria, there is no valve between the superior and inferior vena cava and the right atrium. And, and on the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, I'm sorry, the left atrium, there's no valve between the pulmonary veins and the, and the left atrium. So let's just, on this waveform, let's just start with the A wave. So the A wave is the atria contracting. So the pressure increases as the atrial contracts, and that represents the A wave. Now, as the blood starts emptying out the pressure, the X1 descent starts dropping. And when the pressure in the atria drops below the pressure in the ventricles, the atrioventricular valves close, the mitral and the tricuspid valve. And that, if you do see it, that represents the C wave. And then the X2 descent continues as the pressure continues to drop because the blood has left the atrium. Now, the V wave represents atrial filling. Now, also during atrial filling, on the V wave, the pressure starts coming up, but the ventricles are contracting and emptying out their blood as the atria is filling with blood, and the septum bulges into the atrium with the contraction of the right and left ventricle. And so that you do, that adds to the pressure of the V wave. And then when you either reach the peak of the V wave or the very beginning of the Y descent, that's when the atrioventricular valves open. That's when, let's go with the left side of the heart. That's when the mitral valve opens. And then the Y descent, as the blood is being ejected out, the pressure starts dropping because blood's leaving the chamber, and that's your Y descent. So let's take a look at another waveform. So here's an example of a, of a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. 
Which represents the left atrial pressure, with which represents left ventricular endostatic pressure. So note that the A wave follows the P wave by approximately 240 milliseconds. But this is still the same concept. You find the P wave, comes straight down on the paper. The next hump after that is the A wave. Find the T wave, come down on the paper. The next hump after that is the V wave. So in this example... You find the P wave, come straight down. The next hump after the P wave is the A wave. Or you could find the T wave, come straight down. The next hump after the T wave is the V wave. So once you've identified that in this particular strip, the A wave looks like that, which in this example looks different than the V wave, then you can just march out A wave, V wave, A wave, V wave. Now that is probably the C wave right there. It's, it's not so important to be able to identify. It's just so that you know what it is. Um, so whether it's a wedge, whether it's a right atrial pressure or a left atrial pressure, on the right side, the A wave follows the P wave by about 80 milliseconds. And on the left side, uh, the A wave follows the P wave by about 240 milliseconds. Okay, so now often in the cath lab, you're looking at the wedge in relationship to the left ventricular pressure. And you're doing this because you're evaluating the presence of mitral stenosis and mitral regurge. Now, gen generally speaking, a large A wave is mitral stenosis and a large V wave is mitral regurge, but it, it just does, there's no absolutes. So you can have an A wave and not have mitral stenosis, and you can have a V wave and not have mitral regurg. So there's no, there, are, there are other things that cause a large A wave and other things that cause a large V wave. But oftentimes, <laughs> the, a, the A wave enlargement is mitral stenosis, and oftentimes, the large V wave is mitral regurg. But there's no absolutes. So let's take a look at the wedge as it relates to the uh, left ventricular pressure. So here in this example, you can find the P wave and come down and the next hump up is the A wave. Or you can find the T wave and come down and the next hump up is the V wave. Um, now, it also makes sense that the P wave represents atrial contraction and so this A wave is always going to be by the upstroke of the LV because the upstroke of the LV represents ventricular systole and atrial systole immediately precedes ventricular systole. So hopefully that makes sense that yes, the A wave is going to be by the upstroke of the LV. The A wave is not going to be by the downstroke of the LV. That's where the V wave is. So if you can, and I know this is a zoomed up because you can't, you know, you, you don't read your, your LV pressures are typically, you know, your LV systolic is as high as whatever your uh, AO systolic is, or, you know, or it could be higher if you have aortic stenosis. So you're typically reading LV pressures on a 200 scale, unless you're zooming up looking for the LV EDP, then you're reading on a 25 or 50 scale, depending on how, how high it is. So, and on these atrial pressures, they're typically, you're reading on a 25 scale or sometimes a 50 scale, depending on how high they are. So you don't see the top of the LV. But once you get used to looking at LV pressures, and then because every case that you do in the cath lab, you'll do the LV, and then you measure the LV EDP, and it will zoom up to 25 or 50 scale. And so you just have this classic look that you can recognize that this is the upstroke of the LV, and then that this is the downstroke. So the A wave, while you do know it follows the P wave, it's always going to be right around the upstroke of the LV. So just keep that in mind. Just another little tip to help you find it. Now, because these catheters are in different places, you have one catheter directly in the LV and you have one catheter in the uh, pulmonary capillary wedge bed and you're trying to estimate what the LV EDP is, there's, there's an inherent delay, and you may have to do what's called phase shifting to get the, the wedge pressure waveform to line up where it's supposed to on the left ventricular pressure. So let's take a look at that. 
So the Y descent, which is the downstroke of the V wave, the Y descent should align with the downstroke slope of the LV pressure waveform. If not, you have to shift the wedge pressure to the left. So in this example here, we can see this is the a large V wave, and it the downstroke of the uh, the Y descent lines up exactly with the downstroke of the LV. Now, as we, I don't know if you noticed on the last slide, like, so like you know, mitral stenosis can lead to a delayed emptying, and then you have a delayed Y descent because you have mitral stenosis. So some of the literature will say the peak of the V wave should cross on the downstroke of the LV. That's how you line that up. Some of the literature says, oh no, you need to, you need to line up the downstroke of the V wave with the downstroke of the LV. Now, I mean, if you're really trying to figure out does a person need to have their mitral valve replaced, you're probably going to do transeptal, and you're going to directly measure. You're going to put a catheter in the left atrium instead of using a wedge. So that will give you much more accurate pressure, and I have a slide to show you that in just a minute. So if you do phase shifting, let's see, I have another... Let's look at this slide here for phase shifting. So initially, um, because of the time delay inherent to the generation of the wedge pressure, a large V wave appears with diastole and can give the impression that there's a gradient. And the person, okay, let's look at this slide first. The white area is the shaded area. Let me go back one. Not that it's the exact waveform. But the white area is the shaded area between this downstroke on this particular slide of the red and the downstroke of the yellow here. So it's this, it's this, this gradient that is here. Go to the next slide. All right, let me zoom back up. Okay, so here on this slide, we can see that that's the peak of the V right there. And it's not on the downstroke, this yellow line here. This downstroke of the Y descent certainly is not lining up with the downstroke of the LV. So on this, this is the same patient. This was a wedge pressure, and then they did transeptal, where they punched over from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then they got this. So we can still see the gradient here. Now the peak of the V is at the downstroke of the LV and see how nicely there's just a very, very tiny gradient. So if you're trying to figure out, do we need to do certain, and of course you're not just using the pressures that you generate in the cath lab, but you'll also do an echo to see if these pressures uh, are correlated by your pressure measurements in the cath lab. But if you're trying to figure out, you're going to have, because you got to have your chest open. I mean, I mean, there's other ways of, but if you're going to have a valve replaced, you have to have your chest open, a major surgery to go through, you damn sure need to make sure that your uh, pressure gradients, if they exist, are accurate. So here, while there is a large V wave, it shows that there is no, there's no gradient. There's no significant mitral stenosis. Something else is causing this large V wave. It's not mitral stenosis in this particular example. I mean, this is from a textbook. I don't know the details of this particular patient but there's no gradient. As initially, when you were looking here, you think, well, there's a gradient. Now, I don't know what the gradient is. I, haven't, I don't have all the data to be able to calculate what the gradient is, but you can just look at that and go, the, the numbers are about the same. So if you do one, or if you like a video on uh, mitral valve area, I have a, I'll, I'll leave a link to, the, uh, to that video for doing uh, videos for aortic valve area, mitral valve area. Okay, so hopefully this helps when you're looking at what's the A wave, what's the X1 descent, the C wave, the X2 descent, the V wave, the Y descent. Hopefully this uh, video helps you understand what does the A wave mean, the X wave mean, the C wave, the V wave, the, the Y descent. What does it all mean? You have a reference here. 
that will hopefully help you in your understanding of these right atrial, left atrial, and pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. All right, guys, thanks so much. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up. It would help my channel. And if you found the information helpful, um, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you do, remember to turn on notifications so that you don't miss when the next video comes out. All right, guys, thanks so much. We'll see you in the next video.